Good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome you to uh, this evening's presentation of artwork. Uh, I'm Bonnie Maranka, professor of theater here at Lang College and the curator of the series. Um, artwork, um, it's uh, unbelievable, but it's our ninth year. And uh, this is a series devoted to bringing innovative artists uh, to Lang to talk about their work. Um, tonight's guest is uh, Anne Hamburger, um, a director, producer, writer, and founder of the organization On Guard Arts. She's had a fascinating and varied career over recent decades, working initially in site-specific and immersive environments that produce theater in parks, warehouses, piers, abandoned buildings, street corners, and, and uh, many other uh, sites around the city and cities. Um, thinking back over this geography of inspiration, I remembered standing with an audience at the Bow Bridge in Central Park in 1989, watching an early work of Mac Wellman. So many other ventures of hers followed involved, involving artists well known to us by now, people like Ann Bogart, Jim Simpson, Charles Mee, Marie Irene Fornes, John Kelly, Jonathan Larson, Fiona Shaw, Tyne Daly, Carl Hancock Rooks. Only last week, the New York City showing of the new Reza Abdo documentary featured his extraordinary production of Father Was a Peculiar Man, which Ann Hamburger produced in the meatpacking district long before gentrification and um, the High Line. <clears throat> Soon, this energetic, innovative spirit was brought to the position of executive vice president for Walt Disney Creative Entertainment. For nearly a decade, Anne worked on developing shows, parades, and all kinds of spectacles for the parks worldwide. She brought Broadway artists to create these productions, the same ones who had worked on shows such as Porgy and Bess and Avenue Q in New York. Following the trajectory of this work, one can see an artist and producer who extended the ideals of downtown theater and experimentation from the early years of site-specific work to large-scale entertainments, regional theater, Broadway, and public space. More recent projects include the multimedia performance Bass Track Live, which brought together music, film, and photojournalism to explore the impact of war on veterans. It was created with the families of Marines and toured 20 U.S. cities. Anne is also the force behind the new and free to the public emerging arts festival, BOSS, which translates as big outdoor site-specific stuff. With this festival, the Hudson River Park becomes a performance space for numerous site-specific works. I'm an inventor by nature. I always have been, she says of herself. Invention is no easy task. It requires bringing together teams of artists, finding spaces, raising money, getting the show on the ground, and then keeping everything going. This kind of broad spectrum work is sometimes called cultural entrepreneurism. For those of you who are wondering how to start your own company and galvanize artists to work with you and then produce your work, I am sure that you can find lots of good advice from this evening's guest. She learned early on that it's not enough to be an artist, just as important as to own the means of production. I, for one, would like to ask her about the coming together of performance space and public space, social awareness and philanthropy, art and its public in our time. Please let's welcome Ann Hamburger. Bonnie, I have to steal what you wrote and put it on my website because it sounded so great. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thanks for um, coming. I know it's the end of a long day, and you probably have been working very hard all day long. So I appreciate your coming here. And as Bonnie said, you can see what I've called my um, very beautifully designed PowerPoint today, um, the journey of a serial cultural entrepreneur because um, that's what I am. I'm an inventor. I love inventing things. I love doing the impossible. I don't take no for an answer. And my philosophy about producing is learn the right way to do things, and then when that doesn't work, do whatever it takes. That's my philosophy. 
Um, so I began En Garde Arts in 1985. And before that, I actually came to the theater from um, the world of visual arts. And I've always been fascinated by the intersection of art with the public. And I've really devoted my whole life to busting out of the ivory tower, as it were, and bringing people together, not normally in conversation. So I think that uh, hopefully it will be interesting to you to hear a little bit about my journey and my trajectory uh, over the course of a really, really, really long time. And I don't like to think about how long it is because I'm perpetually immature, so I don't really like to think about how long it's been. So as I said, I began En Garde Arts in um, 1985. Uh, I went to the Yale School of Drama. I was definitely considered to be a renegade at Yale. Um, I didn't purposely cause a lot of trouble, but um, I did, uh, just because I'm always trying to figure out different ways of doing things. Um, at, like, for instance, when I was at Yale, we had to do this really stupid thing, which was design a prompter, which was like a, a newsletter. And so I turned it into fold-out dolls. And the head of the acting program said, oh, this isn't any good. And I said, why not? And he said, I can't fit it on my clipboard. And I said, if nobody reads it, what difference does it make? So um, that was my entree into the Yale School of Drama, um, always trying to figure out how to do things. So I want to approach my history a little bit from the philosophies that um, drive me and hopefully give some of that to you to think about for your own careers and journeys. So the first thing is, if you're going to make a world, um, make life in the theater, the best way to do it is dream the impossible. Think about things that you would love to do, uh, do things that you love, um, and dare to believe things that maybe don't exist. And if you do do that, believe me, there are people that will say to you, it's impossible. Um, when I first got out of Yale and I wanted to do site-specific theater, and I really didn't know what I was doing, but that's never stopped me. I learned through doing, I'm one of those people. I got in touch with the Pierpont Morgan Library, and I said, I want to do a site-specific theater piece in the Pierpont Morgan Library. And she said, dear, I have to tell you, the Pierpont Morgan Library, our job is to look back in history, not forward. And we are not on guard, avant-garde, or any other kind of guard. Thank you very much. And hung up the phone. But I didn't let it stop me. And I have always been committed and loved the whole idea of what is called a total work of art. So what does that mean? A total work of art is not a, a just about telling a story through narrative, through actors on stage. It's about thinking about all of the various things that can go into making a piece of theater. So what else is that? That can be location. It can be design. Um, it can be music. So I've always been very interested in what are the different kinds of ways we can tell stories, and how do those stories intersect with the broader world. So I'm just going to talk about a few of the pieces that I, that I made through En Garde Arts. Um, Bonnie actually talked about Mac Wellman's Bad Penny. And this is on the Bow Bridge. And what you see there is um, you see an actor in a rowboat who was actually going down um, the lake in Central Park Lake. And um, there were audiences on one side of the lake. And this guy who's in the water over there is actually um, in House of Cards now. So it's really fun that I worked with people in the early days. And now they're, I'm watching them all on TV. And, and um, that's really a hoot. But it was really fun to use Central Park as our stage. And we did three different pieces in Central Park. and. Um, it was wonderful to have the New York Times reporter kind of following us around, traipsing through um, Central Park. The reporter um, that was a big support for my career, actually, was a guy named Mel Gussow. Do you, have you guys ever heard of Mel Gussow? No. He um, worked for the New York Times. He was uh, the second in command to Frank Rich. And I actually met Mel because the very first show we did was called Terminal Bar. And um, we weren't ready for the press opening. And um, 
we had to cancel the press. And Mel was going to be coming to our show, but after we canceled the press opening to postpone it, all of a sudden there was no press that was going to be coming. So I, I didn't know what to do, and I decided to sit down and write Mel Gussell a letter to talk about why I loved what I was doing and um, why he should come review my show. And then, um, have you guys heard of phone books? Do you know phone books? Yeah? Well, at the time they existed, and so I looked up his address and phone number in the phone book, and I found out where he lived, which was actually right around here. And I went to his apartment building, and I waited till the door opened, and I snuck in his apartment building, and I took my letter, and I shoved it under his door, and um, I ran away. <laughs> um, and so he then called my press agent and said he wanted to come review our show. And um, my press agent was like, that's so strange. I just haven't been able to get arrested by the New York Times. I can't figure out why all of a sudden they're coming. And I said, well, let me tell you what I actually decided to do. And that's what I mean by um, learn the right things, way to do things and then do whatever it takes. Um, that's kind of uh, the way you actually can manage to do the impossible. So uh, Bonnie talked about this. Um, so father was a peculiar man, um, was this, ex probably it was definitely the craziest thing I think I've ever done. Um, and uh, there was an amazing visionary director named Reza Abdo. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us. Um, Reza was one of the early people to contract AIDS. And as you all know, in the early days of AIDS, if you got AIDS, you died. Um, until they came up with the proper kind of medication. And it, it's a shame, really, because we lost one of the great visionaries of our time. And um, I work in a very instinctual manner. Um, people say, well, what's your process? And um, my, pro my process is very intuitive in a lot of ways. And what I first met Reza in uh, California, and I was so taken by the fact that he was definitely um, a visionary. I felt like he had this incredible visual sensibility and um, things he wanted to do. So I said, I'm going to bring you to New York. And what I used to do with this site-specific work, which nobody had, I mean, nobody had heard of site-specific work when I was doing it. I mean, now everybody's doing an immersive piece in their closet or you know, their bedroom or a hotel room. I mean, it's very common these days, as you know, but it wasn't then. Um, and um, Razor came to New York, and what we did is we just drove around the city in my car. And we went to the meatpacking district, and what the meatpacking district was like then was there were real meatpackers there during the day, and at night there were transvestites. And um, there, was n there were no stores, like the stores you see. It was just cobblestone streets and empty warehouses, and it was very cool and cinematic and wonderful. And Reza was like, I want to do a piece there. And he also said, I want to do an adaptation of the Brothers Karamazov. And so I was like, wonderful, let's do it. And we literally, you could never do this today, actually, got the community boards to agree to let us close off four square blocks of the meatpacking district. I, I really, to this day, I'm not quite sure how, we met, how they agreed to do that, but they did. And what you are looking at here, because you can't really tell, is a table that's going almost all the way down Little West 12th Street. I mean, um, and what you see above is a meat cleaver and a chandelier that we hung across the street. Um, and that was one of the um, big scenes that we did in Father Was Peculiar Man. Also, as Bonnie said, the high line didn't exist. So it was just the, ele the elevated train tracks that were there, and we had this big red curtain that, that was hung from the elevated train track, and it opened, and then you saw 60 dancers in a parking lot. So these were some of the insane things that we did. And the piece was in 13 or stick. It was like this ridiculous number of locations, and they didn't have Bluetooth then, so we literally wheeled speakers around connected to car batteries and, um, and wheelbarrows to get sound from place, place to place. Um, and we sold tickets off the top of my car. 
and the only people that didn't have to buy tickets, and the honor system worked pretty well. We did have one scene in a meat locker that um, actually um, you could only get in if you had a ticket, and the only people that could actually come in for free were transvestites. Um, we figured since they were belonged to the neighborhood, they could actually come in for free. And um, I am not a shy person. <laughs> I think you may be able to tell that. And we really couldn't get permission to hang that meat cleaver and chandelier um, across the street until we happened to wander into the office of this man named Jim Hortensio, who ran one of the big meat packing firms. They were called Long Island Beef. And um, he like headed the neighborhood. I've actually looked him up. He's in prison now. So, um, but um, we walked into his office, and um, the woman who produced this with me is named Portia, and he starts quoting Shakespeare and goes, "Portia, the quality of mercy," and literally starts quoting Shakespeare. But and loved us so much that he literally. It was like the Red Sea had parted, and we got all these um, criminal meatpacking people to like let us do things because he liked us, which was great. But the cool thing about like getting to know all these different people in the communities based upon the work that we did was the work was also really great um, because it had a wonderful sense of narrative. It had beautiful visual imagery, and people got really excited coming to this, these pieces because they felt like a sense of event. And um, to give you an idea of, of, of what I mean by do what you believe in and, and take w when people say things are impossible, take it with a grain of salt. When I was at Yale, I was told the only way you can have a successful theater is if you have a building that people identify theaters with buildings. And so, Annie, you're never going to be successful doing this. It's not going to work. And the head of my program said, you know, I just want you to know your MFA is not going to be dependent upon you being successful in this regard. And I was like, OK. So I went and did it anyway. And um, the truth is, when you're doing something new, you are generally probably breaking rules, you, because that's, that is at the core of invention. Um, this was another um, really wonderful piece that we did. Do you guys all know who Chuck Me is, Charles Me? How many of you know who Chuck Me is? A few of you, okay. Um, he's a pretty well-known writer, and he did this wonderful modern adaptation of Orestes. And um, what you see in the background is there was a twisted metal pier that juts out into the Hudson River um, that no longer exists. It fell down, and this is an actor. Uh, very precariously balanced <laughs> up on the twisted metal pier. Um, this actor is pretty well known now. That was Jefferson Mays. And we um, literally uh, convinced the executive vice president of um, the Trump Organization, which is, and actually Donald Trump came to our benefit, which is now funny. I, I feel like I should go and see if I can find some old pictures and maybe, you know, I could sell them and get more money for our shows. <laughs> but any, that was a joke, people. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Um, we always tried to involve the community in any of this work that we did, and so what the senior executive of the Trump Organization said was that he would let us do the show because he was very confused by what we're doing. He's like, there's no sound, there's no lights, there's no nothing out there. How are you going to do this? And I was like, that's what we do. We'll bring in containers, and Tina Landau directed this, who's kind of a wonderful... Um, visionary, we'll bring in containers, we'll bring in power, we'll bring in all this stuff. And he said, okay, but there's one thing you must do. And I said, what? He said, you have to build a fence. And I was like, build a fence? And he's like, yes, you have to build a fence from 60th Street where people enter to 64th Street where the performance is being held. And I was like, why do we have to build a fence? And he was like, you have to build a fence because people are going to jump in the water. And I said, people won't jump in the water. This is a theater event. It's not a rock concert. You know, he's like, I don't care. You have to build a fence. So I was like, what am I going to do? How can I possibly afford to build a fence? And there was a project nearby. And I went into the middle of the project. And I screamed at the top of my lungs, anybody need a job? And 30 people from the projects followed me down. And I paid them all an hourly fee. And we got our fence built. And that's what I mean by thinking about the innovative ways 
that you can function in order to get done what you need to get done. Because otherwise, you won't do it. Not if it's innovative, you won't do it. So it's always about thinking outside the box, thinking outside the box, um, which I love to do. So I think in life, one of the most important things um, is to really understand when it's time to make a change. And I did something that was really unthinkable in a lot of ways. So I started on Guard Arts in 1985. And we did all these very successful productions that were, we had features in the New York Times and we had huge crowds of people. And then I began to see New York changing. And Brooklyn, believe it or not, was like in the hinterlands at that time. And I saw all these wonderful spaces that were kind of drying up. And I didn't see a way forward that didn't feel like it was a repetition for me, and I'm not good with repetition. Um, as I said, I feed on invention. And so I was ready to make a change, and people were astounded that I was going to fold on guard arts, which is what I decided to do. It had been, I'd been doing it for 13 years, and I decided I wanted to, I, I felt like I was just kind of hitting my head on the ceiling of trying to raise money for these shows, finding interesting locations. You couldn't really do anything in, Bro in Brooklyn at the time. And I felt like I was, I, I was desirous of having a new experience. And what I, I hope you will remember is there are a lot of people that, because of security, because of fear, because of a lot of things, don't make changes that they need to make in their lives. And you guys are young, so everything is new. Everything is changing, right? But as, as people get older, there are people who should leave their jobs, and they don't. They should go to someplace new, and they don't. And I feel like as scary as it is, as much as um, change is, becomes uh, something that, that, that throws a lot of uncertainty into your life, that, that one of the best ways to have the most enriching life is to make change thoughtfully, but to make change when you need to make change. So I applied for the job of artistic director of the La Jolla Playhouse in San Diego, and I got that job. And we, I had two-year-old twins at the time, and we moved out to San Diego, and I became the artistic director of La Jolla Playhouse. And I... A couple of things. One is, it wasn't the right job for me. Um, I am not a six-play season kind of a gal. It just, I just don't fit into that model. So that's one thing. Um, I did start Spring Awakening, which I'm proud of, and brought Thoroughly Modern Millie there. So those shows went to Broadway, and that was great. But I, I don't think that the regional theater structure of having a season is something that, that is complementary to what my skills and abilities are. And I'd been there for about six months, and all of a sudden I get this call, um, and it's, it's a headhunter, it's a search firm from, who's looking to hire somebody to go to Disney as an executive vice president. And I had never met a, somebody from a search firm like that in all my life. You know, like, what are you talking about, you know? And um, I went in and I met with them, and they basically said, um, you're the perfect person, so I'm going to send your resume to California and to LA, and I got the job. Um, and basically, they said, we want you to come in and found and run a global division for Disney. Um, and I had no corporate experience, and um, so I was like, how can I possibly turn this down? And what fascinated me about it, actually, was, again, the opportunity on a grand scale to make a total work of art, right? And um, one of the dreams I had, which actually never happened, but it was one of the things I thought about was, oh my god, just imagine if you could make Main Street completely come alive with actors coming out of the windows and the rooftops and all of that. 
Um, and then I found out that it's Walt Disney was a film guy, so it's forced perspective. So if you had an actor out of the second floor window, they'd look like jolly, they'd look like a giant. Um, but um, I did go to Disney, and the first production I did was in a 2000 seat theater um, at Disney's California Adventure, and it was Aladdin. Um, and um, I brought in Francesca Zambello. Um, who's a very well-known opera director, and she brought in a whole ton of designers. And um, we had a flying carpet that flew above people's heads. And for the first time, the idea of making Broadway-caliber theater in the parks um, was brought to life um, at the Disney Company. Um, Probably the thing, one of the things I'm most proud of with the show, which we um, created in 2003 and just closed two weeks ago, which is kind of amazing. Um, and these Disney shows run four times a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, so you can kind of do the math with that one. Um, was Francesca said, if we're doing this show, we are going to hire all people of color because it is Agrabah. And I said that is absolutely true, that if we want to represent this world, we need to hire all people of color, which we did. Um, and then we also had a woman come into audition who was a quadriplegic, who sang like a bird. Um, and we decided to hire her and put her in the chorus. And what was so amazing about that was all these people came, who come to the parks who were in wheelchairs saw somebody on stage that was a reflection of them. And we got so many emails from people that said, I am so happy to see that somebody can be a performer and also have a disability. And I never in a million years imagined that I could actually do something like that. And so I was very... Um, Proud of it for those reasons. I, you know, one of the things about working in a big company like Disney, beyond the politics, which are um, extraordinary, is there's a lot of. Um, I mean, this is again, it's the same theme in a way. There's a lot of people who will tell you what you can and cannot do um, based on their data they have, right? Um, so Disney, before I came, said that theme park shows only last for three years, that the financial planners had done their studies, and there was a wear-off curve after three years. And therefore, they could only justify spending a certain amount of money on these shows. And then I said, well, but maybe the wear-off curve is where it is, because the shows aren't good. Um, and they were like, oh, I never thought of that. You know, I know it sounds ridiculous, but you wouldn't believe how often I encounter, encountered this at the Disney company where, and I think, it's, I think it's in business a lot more common than you could ever imagine that again, people have this kind of closed circle of thinking and their closed circle justifies their own opinions. And the minute you like break that circle apart, then all of a sudden the opinions start to dissolve, right? And invention requires breaking apart the circles. So I think uh, another, um, or something I've already mentioned, but I think is really important when you're in the arts is that you have to trust your instincts. Um, so there was another large theater that we had to fill was in the animal kingdom and I, said to everyone that I wanted to do Finding Nemo uh, as a musical. And that was like a big deal because um, Pixar films had never been turned into musicals before. And the guy who wrote this, who now is very famous, is the guy who wrote Frozen. And I brought him to the Disney company. And so we decided to do Finding Nemo as a musical and um, they weren't going to let us do it, and then they heard some of the music that Bobby Lopez wrote, and Kristen, his wife, wrote the, wrote the script, and they decided to let us do it. But I got a call from my boss one day who said, I want you to come up to the CEO's office and play him the music. 
So I was like, oh, my God, I'm in jeans. I can't come up to his office. The CEO of the whole Disney company. He was like, no, you come up. And so I went up to his office. We sat there and we listened to the score. It's very surreal. Just sat there and listened to it. And at the end of it, he said, you know, I really love it, but I don't, there's one song I just don't like. I don't think it's very funny. So I was like, OK. Um, I also instituted the uh, practice of um, staged readings, which hadn't existed in the theme parks before. Like they used to have, um, when they used to figure out whether or not they were going to do things, they had illustrations on the wall. And I was like, this is theater, so I don't, you can have a really pretty illustration. That doesn't mean you're going to have a good show. So I instituted um, staged readings. So we had the CEO, my boss, and the CEO, and a bunch of people come to see the stage reading of Finding Nemo the Musical. And before he came, my boss said to me, you changed this song, right? And I said, um, no, I didn't change it. And he said, uh, uh, the CEO of the Disney company just told you to change a song, and you didn't change a song? And I said, no. I said, I think he's wrong. So the steam starts coming out of his ears, you know? He like, can't believe that I actually just said the CEO is wrong. And he said, well, I think you should tell him about it ahead of time. And I said, no, I don't think so. I, don't, I, I think he should watch it, and then we'll go to my office, and we'll, we'll talk about it. So he goes to my office, and um, it, we, he watches the show, and then we all go to my office, and um, he looks at me and he goes, you know, you didn't change that song. And my boss was sitting on the edge of his chair, like he was really hoping that I would just have my you-know-what handed to me on a platter, right? He really was like hoping I'd get it because he was pissed off at me that I was so flippant about the whole thing. And I said, no, what'd you think of it? And he said, I thought it was great. And he said, feel free to ignore me anytime. <laughs> so I... Um, I have to say, I actually loved that. It was really great. And it just shows that, you know, despite pressure, if you really feel very strongly about something, you need to trust your instincts. That doesn't mean you shouldn't listen to people, but it does mean that it's important to trust your instincts. Something happened, though, while I was there that um, was really tough. And this is like the tough side of corporate America, which was, the New York Times was going to come down and do a feature on Finding Nemo the Musical. And at the same time, Tarzan was on Broadway and had gotten eviscerated in the press. And so the Disney company decided to cancel our press opening because they felt the company would be embarrassed by having a theme park show get a great review while a Broadway show got trashed. And no one told me about it. So this is the kind of behind the scenes of vicious, vicious stuff that can also happen in a company. Uh, it's part of the reason I came back <laughs> because I just had had, had enough. But um, I also had had enough because I felt a little bit like, uh, again, you know, I'm some bit, I'm an inventor, and as long as I could invent while I was there, um, I was really happy. And once I stopped being able to invent, I got unhappy. Um, one of the great things that I did get from working at Disney is I got the chance to work in culture, cultures all over the world. And I don't know, do any of you come from another country? Not a one, one person? Oh my goodness. OK. Um, well. The thing that I think you guys will find as you go traveling around the world, um, which I'm sure you will, is that people in other countries function really, really differently than we do as Americans. And working in other countries is so fascinating because you get to learn about these differences in communication styles and values. And um, I think sometimes we can make a lot of mistakes as a country because we don't respect those cultural differences and don't really understand them. And um, I think it's great that now people are traveling so much more than they ever used to, and they're, uh, our cult uh, we're so interdependent in a lot of ways. But there still are serious, serious differences in 
the way a theme park functions in Japan versus France versus Hong Kong versus Florida, which is another country. I mean, all of these places. Um, and um, and it, was a fa um, it was a fascinating journey for me to take, and I'm glad I had it. Um, I have to say, um, I think courage is a state of mind. And what I mean by that is, I think to create is a scary thing. And is it, yeah, I think um, you can listen to the scared part in your head, or you can accept that you've got that part in your head and still proceed forth anyway. So when I got to the point where I felt like there was nothing more to invent. I needed to leave. So I was there for eight and a half years, and then I came back to New York, and I decided to do something which I don't believe anybody else in the country has ever done, which is uh, relaunch my now-for-profit theater on Guard Arts. I mean, who does that, right? And because it doesn't really make a lot of sense in certain ways, but um, I decided that when I really started thinking about what I wanted to do, that that was the thing for me to do. And I think the other thing I've always been guided by my whole life is to really try to think about who I am, where I am, and what I have to offer in the context of society, um, and what's needed. Um, because if what you're doing isn't needed, then why do it? So in coming back to New York after having been gone for a really long time, um, I noticed certain things that were major changes um, in New York, which is um, when I first started on Guard Arts, site-specific work didn't exist. I put it on the map. 9-11 had happened. Um, Immersive theater was kind of a ha has become a household word. Social media didn't exist. Now it kind of runs all our lives, I think. So I started seeing it myself. Well, what what do I want to do? What can I do, and what is needed in New York now and in the artistic community? And I this is one other thing, which is when you become well known for something. One of the things that can happen is you can create your own box. Um, and I loved what I did with Hunger Arts, and I was really proud of it, but I became known as the site-specific producer. And I knew that coming back, I wanted to do site-specific work, but I didn't want to just do that. I wanted to engage in a broader exploration and discovery of what it means to tell stories in a kind of 21st century fashion. And that's the kind of exploration and journey that I'm on now. And I don't think there's one answer to that. But I'm not somebody personally who's interested in like a producing a play. I never have been really interested in producing a play. Um, I'm interested, again, in this total work of art. In, in what are all the different elements of theater that combine to tell story? You can tell stories through actors on stage, speaking, but you can tell story through an extraordinary visual image. You can tell story through a piece of music. You can tell story through movement theater. And what I'm interested in is how do all those things combine to create a work of art that is moving, heartfelt, and accessible. Um, and the accessibility piece is, is personally important to me because, as I said earlier, I really feel like I've spent my whole career trying to think about how to put people together not normally in conversation. And I get really excited by that and using the work that I do to kind of really meet people who I never in a million years would have met. So also, I don't, I don't play a numbers game. Like, um, and it, I shouldn't say it's a game, but uh, it, personally, there's a lot of organizations that put on their websites, this year we produced 150 artists. This year we did 45 commissions, and that is great. Um, that's not the way I function. Um, 
I may spend three years on one piece. Um, so the first piece that I did with the relaunch of Encore Arts was this piece called Bass Track Live. And I went to a workshop at Juilliard, and it was a multimedia piece, and I completely fell in love with it. And it was a, a documentary theater piece about that was derived from photographs that a photographer took in Afghanistan and video interviews that he did that he then posted online um, on a website called Base Track. And it was the first time in the history of the Afghanistan war that social media was used to enable families to communicate with their loved ones. And so these families that were left behind would look on the website and they'd be able to see interviews with their loved ones and also go on Facebook and communicate with other families. And so this whole online community developed. So I was fascinated by this whole concept and said, I would like to take this little workshop that was at Juilliard that probably would have died on the vine right there and I would like to blow it out and make it into a larger piece. But then in asking myself the question like, how can that happen? I said, you know, if we're going to make it into a larger piece, we have to tell more of the story than just who these people were in Afghanistan, because there's a story and what's happened to these people coming home. And 0.4% of the American public goes to war again and again and again and again. But it is 0.4%. It's a tiny fraction of people that are serving in our military. And I was interested in who these people were. And so there were all these incredible photographs. Um, these are some of the photographs from the photographer. Um, and we found the people who are in these photographs through Facebook, actually. Because when we first started working on this and called up the military and said, can we get names and email addresses and phone numbers, they were like, oh, no. And I realized we would never um, find these people. And so um, we um, put out a note on Facebook and found all these people who were in these photographs um, and interviewed them and, got, and then sent a camera crew to um, actually interview people who, back in the United States and um, met this wonderful man, um, uh, AJ, who was really happy to tell his story, and he became the center of our show. And Bass Track Live actually had um, two actors on stage, um, one playing AJ, one playing um, AJ's ex-wife, now ex-wife, <laughs> and chronicling their story. And then it had these photographs and videos intertwined with the video design, and then this amazing kind of electroacoustic score that was really beautiful and four musicians on stage. I'm um, happy to say the piece was named um, top 10 by the New York Times. It was at BAM, and it traveled to 25 cities across the country. And as it traveled across the country, we developed engagement programs where we brought people who've served together with um, theater goers and the general American public. And it was one of the more moving experiences I've ever had. Here's a little clip um, that'll give you a sense of the show. My name is Sergeant Logan Fromey. Um, I'm with 1st Town 8th Marines, Bravo Company, 2nd Platoon. I'm from Dubois, Indiana. My age is I'm 21. Cool, Perry. I joined the Marine Corps. Uh, my first name is Michael. Father, I'm from, I enlisted in New Purdue, uh, Virginia. In, uh, I'm 23 years old. Right my name is uh, Lance Gordon James Jones, from Boston, Mass. with 1-8 uh, Bravo so Company, 2nd so Platoon. My name is uh, H.P. Uh, Jackson, uh, uh, Joshua Jackson. It's in my blood. I am a Fleet Marine Force Corpsman. My name is uh, Corporal Sean R. Smith. Uh, I'm a squad. My name is Rob Rain, uh, First uh, Lieutenant, 81. Uh, Captain John Campbell, uh, Bravo Company. First Lieutenant, uh, Nicholas Viscas, 26 years old. 
I'm last couple Richard Gilligan. I'm with 1-8. My name is Justin Chu. I'm Sergeant. Uh, last couple of Domingo uh, Alfredo Espinal. Uh, I'm a machine gun. I'm Corporal Gonzalez. My name is NT3 Todd Angel. I'm a second attack for others. Staff on Castellan. Sorry, Eric. Sorry, so sorry. Last couple of Jonathan Savage. My name is Alex Jenkins. Last couple of Dallas, Texas. With me. First Titan, 8th Marines, Bravo Company, 1st Platoon. I'm in 3rd Squad. And uh, my billet in the squad is Squad Point Man, as you know. You went on patrol with me yesterday and I was at the front. Oh, man. Yeah. No question about it, man. We're the best. My name is AJ Shubai. I grew up in Fort Worth, Texas, and I'm a United I think States I actually put the whole show on here by accident. <laughs> so that would take a while. Um, so, uh, I'll see if I can, you know, I don't know why you're, you're seeing the wrong thing, but um, anyway, that gives you a sense of the multimedia piece of it at any rate. Um, while base track was going around the country, I learned a lot of things. One is um, I saw community engagement being done in a way that was really effective, and I saw community engagement being done in a way that wasn't. And um, I was really proud of the piece, but I think um, to take a piece of work that can really be truly meaningful and, an, and impactful and to have experiential engagement programming so that people can really engage in a dialogue about what they've seen and how they've been moved and how they've been effective takes a lot of expertise and it takes long-term partnerships. Base Track is actually going back out on tour again in the fall. So it went to 25 cities. It's probably going to go to about another 15. And I, in seeing how it was going all across the country, said to me, this is a very interesting business model for how I can be developing shows and having them have great impact by traveling all over the country. Um, there are different kinds of traveling mechanisms um, in the United States for theater, um, there's obviously commercial theater, like, you know, um, one of the, you know, the Broadway shows going around, but there's also university presenters that are the more adventurous people who are bringing work into their communities, and they are natural partners for us. While um, this was going on, while we were traveling with Bass Track, I had something happen to me in my own life that was very profound, which is I have kids. And I had my 16-year-old son really fall off the rails. Um, he was very depressed. He was anxiety-ridden. And um, it got to the point where I couldn't reach him at all. That's uh, an amazing thing for a parent to have to deal with. And um, he wouldn't come out of his room. And um, I was really worried he might actually hurt himself. And I emailed a friend uh, about what I should do, and she said, wilderness. So I didn't know about wilderness therapy programs. I had never heard of them. Um, and I started to find out about them. And I found out that they are um, interventions where you can send your kid, if you are really at your wit's end with them um, and are concerned about them, out into the wilderness um, where they are engaged in 24-7 therapy and they are disconnected from phones and from the world and from you and from school and from all the pressures that um, a lot of you guys face all the time. And, um, uh, it was a really profound experience for me to actually send my kid to a wilderness therapy program. Um, and then I just said, you know, I want to make art out of this. So I contacted the head of this wilderness therapy program and said, I would love to gain access to the families um, that you are working with so I can hear about other people's stories. And after he realized I wasn't some creepy reality TV show producer, he sent a letter out and I got barraged with parents who said, I want to tell my story. I want to tell my story. And so I've spent the last year and a half interviewing um, parents and their kids across the country and recording those interviews on Skype, which is really, it's a great technique I find because A, 
Um, the thing about Skype that's so fascinating is you can meet a stranger, you can talk to someone you've never talked to before, and they're sitting in their kitchen, and the only thing between you and them is a computer screen, and there's not a lot of lights, and there's not a lot of cameras, and people will just pour out their hearts to you. And I purposely interviewed parents separately from kids because you all know how many of you think if you ask you and your parents tell the story, you're going to be telling the same story? Right. <laughs> um, so it's very fascinating. It's been very fascinating to hear what is the point of view from a younger person versus what is the point of view from their parents. So Seth Boakley is the director who did bass track with me, and I love him as a collaborator. That's one of the other things I haven't really talked about that. It's very important to have the right people sitting around the table when you're putting together a show, because if you don't have the right collaborators, you're going to drive yourself crazy and not accomplish what you want to accomplish. Um, and so I called up Seth, and I said, I would love to have you do a second show with me. And he said, great. And um, as I said, I have been interviewing people across the country. And we found the most interesting stories to us and the, most, and the stories that were the most different from one another. And Wilderness is going to open in October at the Abrams Art Center and run for four weeks. Again, it's multimedia. So there will be six actors on stage, three actors playing the part of um, young men that we interviewed and three actors playing the parts of young women. And then there's actually going to be real, actual parents on video screens recorded that are going to be a part of the show. And that this incredible musical score, this kind of folk rock score that in part will be recorded and part played live. And I have a little um, excerpt from, let's hope this is the right one, from um, Wilderness. This is a workshop that we did at Pace University with the Pace University students um, in, the in the development of the piece. And here's a little section of Wilderness. Sending her to Wilderness was one of the most terrifying things I ever did. I got woken up at four in the morning. My dad had his phone out and there's like a light. And at first I thought he was filming it. And then I saw John and I was like, well, this can't be good. And then I saw a cop and I was like, this is gonna fucking suck. I dive into this one only to find that it's a night sky. So I was out there for 81 days. Very hard to be away from my family for that long in the dead of winter. I fall I saw no light at the end of the tunnel. I didn't see recovery. I didn't see um, me getting better. I didn't see a future. Wellness therapy interrupts crisis, but it also provides an incredible spiritual, emotional, and sophisticated intervention for people to change their lives, to make a turn in their lives toward a healthier place. He needed, to he needed to demonize us because we were oh. throwing everything in the kitchen sink at him to try to get him to respond. I felt like an apple out of all the beautiful pears. The show looks at wilderness therapy from three angles, from the perspective of the young person who goes to wilderness, from the perspective of the parents who in most cases make the decision, sometimes with the child's knowledge and sometimes without, to send that young person to wilderness therapy. And then the third person is the therapist, or the transporter, which is one of the employees who works to bring that person to the wilderness therapy program and then actually guides them through therapy. I was just like, I feel like I'm dying. This might be the last time you see me. He left July 1st. He says, we're going on six months, and I hate it. And it's also the greatest thing in the whole wide world. Because there's really no in between, you know. You either do it or you don't. a 
a strength inside of herself to, to take care of herself in a way that wasn't about manipulation or lying or rage. She was only left with her. Hated it, but it saved my life. So, um, I'm very excited about um, the show. We're gonna take it down to the University of Florida Gainesville to do a technical residency this summer. And then, as I said, we're opening it at the Abrams Arts Center um, in October. And we're already setting up uh, partners all across the country for a tour, and this time really trying to look at how we can do experiential um, engagement programming um, to make people feel like they're having a dialogue and understanding the issues around mental health in our country um, and there's a lot of depression, there's a lot of drug use, there's a lot of alcoholism. And the thing that strikes me to such a great degree is people feel so alone in that. And the truth is, when we did this workshop at Pace and I asked everybody in the audience how many people either knew someone, a uh, close friend or a family member who suffered from one of these issues, everybody raised their hand. So, you know, I, I feel like if I can create a piece of theater, multimedia piece like this that's really um, top flight in terms of its um, value as a piece of art and at the same time can help to bring people together to make people realize they're not alone in some of these issues and have those two things intersect. Um, it's a great thing for me to be doing. Then on the more frivolous side, <laughs> I decided to open my house and do a site-specific theater piece in my house recently. Um, so we did a piece called Versailles 2016. It brought the entire community where I live in Westchester together. I had 160 people coming through my house over the course of a weekend. Um, probably one of the funniest things that happened was my daughter said, Ma, can I have a comp? And I said, yeah, you can have a comp. Um, and we did pieces in the bedroom. We did pieces in the bathroom. And um, it was really quite fun. And we have a tremendous amount going on now. Besides Wilderness, we're continuing our BOSS program. I want to be commissioning younger artists and um, getting to know them and make sure that I'm available, because I think it's very important for more mature artists to be mentors for younger people. Um, and continue to explore and discover and try to understand that unknowable thing called making a great piece of work and looking at what those elements are that can combine to making something that's memorable and meaningful for a large number of people. Thank you. So now we can have some questions. Hello, my name is Daniel. I'm an alumni from here, the new school. But uh, sorry for booing you when you mentioned Florida. I'm from there, and uh, <laughs> I just know all about it. A little bit too much, I'd say. Um, was that Tyler Lamar in the Bass Track Live? Yeah. That's awesome. I know him. I, uh, yeah, I did a short film with him once. Um, so I'm curious, uh, when you were, perf when you were uh, putting up your shows, how did you really get the word out to the community that you were doing what you were doing? I mean, in the beginning, how did you get a large audience to come and see some of your shows? Um, you know, 
part of the way people became aware of the shows was by virtue of their location. I mean, you know, the way people become aware of shows today is so fundamentally different from what we did back then, which is like you sent out mailings, right, through snail mail. Doesn't work right? anymore. No, no, no. And I think something that's, uh, you know, I talked about then and now. Um, I think something that's, one of the things that's fundamentally different in my opinion is that I think millennials, I'm making a big broad statement, but I think it's true, don't like to be sold to. They like to discover. How many of you think that's true? What I just said. Raise your hands high, everyone see. How many, how many of you think that's not true? So some, how many of you don't care? No, okay. Um, so yeah, I think, I think it really is true. You know, you see all these things, it's like come to a secret space and, um, I think, I think um, part of what's happened is y'all are so bombarded by stuff, right? You can't even read, like, you know, on the internet in peace. You have ads, 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 and there's so much more information that's happening at so much of a faster pace um, that I think today it's about how to differentiate who you are. What's the story you're telling about your work? And how is it different from what anybody else says? Like, I've begun to call myself a cultural anthropologist because I feel like I'm an excavator of stories and then using that material for multimedia work. But, um, you know, it's so hard to figure out how to articulate what you're doing, especially if you're trying to do something new. Um, and, uh, you know, how do you do that? Do you do that through a website? Do you do that through Facebook? Um, I certainly don't have any of the answers. I think it's a different world though, than it was then. But I mean, one of the things was people in the community would find out about things by virtue of the fact that it was in their own backyard. And then Ungard also built a reputation over time um, where people would look forward to these shows when they came because they were so unique um, and unusual. So who else? Hi, um, my name's Emma, and I'm a senior in visual studies here. Um, and I know earlier you spoke to kind of working to respond to a need that you see around you, be that in New York City or in the country. And I guess I'm just wondering what currently in your work, if there's something specific that you're trying to respond to in the country or in New York City or in your own community. Um, Maybe, I don't know if wilderness is that need or something else. But. Yeah, I think each piece has its own set of um, goals in a way, but I think the larger issue is, as I had said earlier, that I'm interested in how one tells stories today. Um, and I think, I think um, the exploration of that and doing that successfully through a variety of different mediums is important. And then for me to, you know, I think so often what happens with work that deals with um, social issues is it becomes, it doesn't succeed as a work of art. It becomes community service. Um, and I'm interested in <clears throat> work that succeeds as a work of art. And when I say succeeds, I mean that someone comes and they're moved and, um, even if it's tough stuff, that it's enjoyable and that it has a sense of heart and that it's complex. Um, you know, the reason why I think something like a wilderness takes so long is I'm engaged in the process of um, learning and understanding the material as I'm developing it. I don't come to a, sh to the, to a show like Wilderness or even Bass Track with a set of preconceived notions. And a very well-known documentarian said to me that successful documentaries are when you let the material um, lead the story. You don't come with the story before you discover the material. And I think that's true. And I think what's happened today is there's a lot of artists who will go out and um, get five minutes of information and write a play. <laughs> and, um, and so therefore, that it doesn't go very deep. And I think the other thing that can so often happen is people have very strong opinions about something. Um, and then they write a play about their opinion. 
And then what happens is that the only people that see the show are people that already agreed with them before they walk through the door. So how can you be an activist if you're performing to your friends and they already agree with you and that's as far as it goes? I mean, so how does, how does one really bust, bust outside of the ivory tower? Um, it, I don't, it's not like there's one answer to any of this. But I, I think it's, it's about um, engaging in a process of understanding and discovery in the initial creation of a piece, and then making sure that through the delivery system of a piece, you're getting outside um, of the ivory tower, as it were, and so that um, people who don't autom automatically agree with one another, and you can come together in conversation and I think that's what can break down differences because we really are living in a very polarized world um, in a way that is, um, I find, incredibly disturbing. Um, we're living in a, in a world of sound bites. So uh, hopefully I can help to combat that a little. Yeah. Yes, hi, uh, my name is Gideon. And uh, first I wanna say that the wilderness piece uh, looks very impactful. I distinctly remember being 13 years old and watching my brother being taken off to second nature and uh, receiving letters from him uh, that they would allow him to write uh, every month and, and such about how he was doing and uh, seeing him come back and the, the difference that it sort of made on uh, all of our lives. Uh, my question is, you mentioned that site-specific performance and immersive performance are sort of everywhere now, and you have, you know, long-running, expensive hotel room shows, and, you know, that maybe that area is becoming um, fully saturated. And so I'm curious if you have any predictions or ideas about what the next space of innovation in theater and performance will look like. Oh my God, what time is it? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I don't know what the next, I, I only know what I'm doing, you know, <laughs> to try to move forward my own sense of discovery. I couldn't possibly predict what the next innovation would be. I, you know, I think site-specific work for me came from a particular impulse. Um, and the impulse was to kind of use the city as my stage, in a way, as our stage. And these pieces that we did, I think the most successful work that we did was outdoors. Um, and you really use the environment in a way that was narrative and also visual spectacle. Um, and what that accomplished, again, was brought together people from the neighborhood, the community board, the fire department, the police department, people who go to the theater, people who don't go to the theater. And it became this wonderful kind of event that happened. It became like people were like intrepid adventurers to like come to our shows that sometimes are very out of the way. And um, battling rain, bringing their umbrellas, you know. Um, there was this very adventurous Spirit. And the sites weren't literal. And I think a lot of what's happening with site-specific work today is it's very literal. Um, I'm going to do a piece, a well-made play, in a hotel room that's about a drama in a hotel room. So that's not that interesting to me because really what something like that does is it maintains the traditional relationship between an audience member and a narrative. It's not really engaging new people into the dialogue because it may be in a hotel room, but it's still just the 15 people who, you know, are interested in coming to it. So I'm interested in, in site-specific work when it embraces metaphor. One more question. Thanks. Hi, uh, my name's Thomas. I'm a senior theater major here. I'm wondering, in terms of the more immersive pieces, like Bad Penny and Father Was a Peculiar Man, how much you would change your process 
to accommodate for the fact that audiences might only get a fragment of the work rather than the entire piece. Um, and whether or not you think that changes it, whether it adds or takes away anything. Um, I think most of the people that came to see our work at that time saw the whole thing. Um, and there were some people who walked by and went, what the hell is this thing going on? Um, and that's, o that's okay. But I mean, the pieces weren't meant to be seen you know, as, as fragments. They were meant to be seen as total evenings. I mean, that was the intention behind them. But it was fun to see the way it wasn't even just people, people and things. Like when we did Orestes, it was, I remember one of the most magical nights was seeing this big cruise ship that went along, you know, in back of the show. That this sense of the unexpected, of never really knowing um, how the environment is going to interact with what you do. Um, but that it takes, it was very complicated to do from a technical perspective, but also that doing um, immersive work, site-specific work, even documentary theater work, it's like you have to recognize that uh, you can't, uh, if you fight it, it will win. Like, you can't fight the site, you'll lose. And so there has to be a respect for the material and the location and the community um, and the things that really are larger than you, um, if that makes sense to you. All right, well, thank you very much.